you know, I think that there's clearly some time that is productive non-selling time. It was amazing how much people said the number one pain they have and the number one time waster they have is trying to find the right content for their process. It is a direct correlation between the organizations that have invested in sales enablement and those that are seeing literally 20, 30 percent plus increases in their conversion rates of opportunities to close deals. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast. Welcome to the show. I appreciate your time. I say this at the end of the show, nearly every single episode, but I think it's worth repeating at the beginning and the top of it in that if you weren't listening to this, there'd be no there'd be no show. I would not be doing this full time. And so I massively appreciate you tuning in every week, the iTunes reviews, the feedback, the sharing, because I'm noticing a lot more of that happening over the past few weeks over LinkedIn, over Twitter, over Facebook. And so, you know, personally, and I genuinely mean this, I appreciate it. Today's show, we're talking about efficiency. I think it's a massive hack for salespeople because if you can improve your day-to-day efficiency, you're not just getting better at one section of sales, for example, prospecting or closing, you're affecting the whole thing. It's a real needle mover. And it's something that I've struggled with in the past. Today's guest is Matt Hines. You can find out more about him over at hinesmarketing.com. He's got an awesome new book, which is available totally for free on his website called Full Funnel Marketing. It's well worth checking out. We link to both of those in the show notes over at salesman.red. And Matt is a repeat winner of the top 50 most influential influential people in sales and lead management and also the top 50 sales and marketing influencers. Uh, I've gained a lot from Matt's blog. Really, uh, I do enjoy it. I read it regularly. We link to a couple of posts over in the show notes as well. And with that all said... Let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Matt, and welcome back to the Salesman Podcast. Thanks very much for having me. You are more than welcome. Okay, so today I want to talk about efficiency of salespeople. And that might sound like a bit of a dry subject, but I'm I'm, I'm convinced it's not because I think productivity is something that's massively overlooked. And we're spending so much time in work, we'd be stupid not to make the most of it. And this all came about... From I was on your website and I saw a metric from our friends over at Voresight that the average sales, I'm a, I'll air quote this, but the average sales professional spends just 33% of their day actively selling. So this just got me intrigued. And furthermore, the kind of person that would listen to a show like this mm. would seek out a podcast to learn more about sales, uh, to become better at it. Mm-hmm. They are probably still inefficient because... I imagine, and we'll dive into this, of of company culture and and all these other things that hold people back without them perhaps not even realizing. So using that number, if 33% of people's time is, if if people are wasting the rest of it, is that because they are, and this is a clearly loading question, is it because they are skiving the rest of the time and they're, they're just being lazy and they're not putting in the work or is there more to it than that? Well, it's a mix of things, right? I mean, I think there's clearly, you know, it's impossible for any of us to be productive 100% of the time. Uh, We all need breaks. We all need mental breaks. We need coffee breaks. We need to walk around. Um, That's part of it. Um, You know, I think that there's clearly some time that is productive non-selling time. Um, Training, learning, practicing, preparing, um, you know, there's things you're doing that are making you better when you are actively selling. But there are also plenty of uh, productivity drains that are completely useless. Um, You know, if you think about the amount of time people spend in CRM, uh, we all as salespeople need to use CRM, but most of us use it way too much. We have CRM administrators that think it's their job to help us use it to, to, to make CRM as complicated as possible. And I think most sales managers would be appalled if they actually knew how much time their reps were spending in CRM between calls. So the idea is not to get you from 33% to 95%. You're never going to get there. But if you could simply go from 33 to 40 to 42 to 45 I mean, think about the massive increase in productivity that represents across an entire sales team. And I'm convinced that there's there's room for that productivity gain in improving processes, in improving systems, in better use of technology, uh, in creating better consistency of how those best practices are applied across the sales organization. Okay, you give me loads to go out there. I think it's important to start from the very top of this of 
uh, so you've already said that perhaps if preparing time isn't counted within that selling time, that that number might not be the best thing to go at. And we'll just talk more generally than p- particularly perspe- uh, specific percentages. But how do we measure how productive we're being? Um, I'm an analytics-based guy that I'm, I'm sure working in marketing, you've got this, this side of you as well. How do we know where we're at so that we can then develop uh, a plan to improve our efficiency yeah well i I mean it's either so a you know there's i'll talk about a couple ways you can measure it if you don't measure it it's still okay because you generally know that there's time you're spending actively selling there's time you're not selling there's productive non-selling time there's non-productive i mean like you know some of that's just common sense Mm -hmm. right um but if if you want to precisely measure it uh you know one of the shortcuts of doing that is a tool called rescue time uh, you can apply it to your own uh, browser. You can apply it to your team's browsers, and you can assign active versus non-active status to different things you're doing. If you're in CRM, that's non-active. If you're using GoToWebinar, that's active. Um, you know, if you're in email, uh, maybe, maybe not. Right. So, <laughs> so I think um, you can sort of estimate, or at least ballpark, sort of at least where you're wasting time. And if nothing else, like even if you're not measuring your active selling time precisely. What if you could measure how much time you're spending in CRM? Like how much time are you literally in CRM updating data on a weekly basis? Some of that is required, but some of that could be automated. Some of that could be done for you. Some of that could be eliminated if there's data being inputted that no one's actually using or looking at. Yeah. I mean, this happens on every sales organization. You know, you have a CFO that three years ago said, I want to track something, and the sales team all still puts it, you know, inputs it into CRM, yet no one is looking at it, right? And so there's an, a massive amount of wasted time and effort in data where that time could be spent selling. So this is what I wanted to get into, and you've, you've, you've queued this up perfectly. How much of all of this, in the grand scheme of things, and this goes across a person's career, not just today, I'm going to spend X amount of minutes doing this, this, and this. How much of sales time is wasted by corporate nonsense, by having to do, I know my background, crap loads of these horrible reports that don't mean anything to the salesperson, but they mean things higher up the food chain, how much of time is wasted through things like that? And inputting data is clearly included in this. Well, it's it's it varies by organization, obviously. But let's let's let me give an example of something that I think is organizationally wasted time that people don't always think about. We did a study recently with the sales enablement company, and we asked sales reps to rank the things they were spending the most time doing, and it wasn't judging those things. It was just what you know of these things. Where are you spending the most time? The top three were number three was CRM usage. Number two was creating content. Number one was looking for content. It was amazing how much people said the number one pain they have and the number one time waster they have is trying to find the right content for their prospect. And if they can't find it, then they often go and create it themselves. And so to me, that is a a, a corporate time waster because the organization should be investing time and efforts in creating the right content that people need and making that easier to find. Uh, and and if let me simply- just interrupt you then. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. I, I think you said it, but I missed it. Is that was that study done on sales B two B sales professionals? Yes. Yeah. B two B sales reps. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a side question here, and then we'll come back to the main topic. But uh. and th- this is split. I'm going to ask it because it's split guests 50 50 so far, and I'm I'm really intrigued. I think if I ask the same question in 12 months, it'll be a different split. Should salespeople be creating content at all, or should they be? pushing out what marketing gives to them? So my short answer is no, salespeople should not be creating content. Uh, The longer answer I think goes like this. I think that most content salespeople are given is crap. Uh, (laughs) It's not valuable. It's not something that they would be proud to put in front of their customers. It doesn't address a specific problem or address address a specific point in the buying journey that's going to help that deal move forward. Too much content created by marketing and product marketing is about the product and is self-serving and doesn't address the people and problems that is what the sales process is all about. So in that context, I don't blame salespeople for saying, screw it, I'm going to create my own content. But despite the fact that there are some good content creators, there are some good writers on the sales floor, in general, that is not a skill set that we hire for in sales. And it's not something that we need sales to do. In a world where we are we are specializing in sales, we are we are identifying separate people that are doing appointment setting, separate people that are that are doing the closing. 
it stands to reason that we should not have those same people responsible for creating their own content. This is not a dig on salespeople. This isn't saying salespeople are dumb and can't create content. Um, you know, I, I run a small business. Uh, I don't do my, I have an accountant. I don't, I have a lawyer. Like I could probably figure that stuff out, but it's not worth my time. It's not my best use of time. I make that same case for salespeople and content. And the reason I ask that is again, there's this 50, 50 split. I, I flip flop all the time as regular listeners will know in that I think if a salesperson is capable of creating the content, it's really empowering for them. They're building their own audience. And especially if they are going to be a career salesperson in a specific industry, albeit whether it's a specific region or not, that that's comes important in certain industries. Um, but they can basically own the customers and become unsackable if they have the customers coming to them because of all that. So I, from one minute, I'm like, yes, salespeople should create content. The next minute, we're talking about efficiency. We're talking about what closes deals. And we're talking about, uh, and you know, that's where your commission comes from. And that's why we're working in sales. And so well, real quick, we could separate the idea of creating content and sharing content. Like salespeople sure. should absolutely be sharing content. Like the more you can be seen as a trusted advisor, the more you can be seen as a source of great value added content, the better. That is that is a clear yes to me. Um, what's what's what I question is whether salespeople should be responsible for creating that content to begin with. Even mm -hmm. if they're just curating content from third party sources, I don't think they should always be responsible for finding it. Like the same content you're curating as a sales rep, you probably have a bunch of other reps that are want to do the same thing to their customers just in different you know regions or different industries. So someone centrally in sales enablement, sales operations and marketing should be doing that work for them. Definitely totally agree. And uh, again, we'll just we'll Stay on this for a second, then we'll get back to efficiency. And I guess it's all the same conversation in the end. Should, or no, no, let me rephrase that. Is there a trend for sales enablement as a as a person to be in a company? Is there more and more people doing a job like that? And is this a trend that we're going to see continuing in the future? Or are sales and marketing going to finally align? And I feel like I've been talking about this for years and years and in my sales roles that I've done in the past in the medical device world, I put the groundwork for a whole load of social before I guess it was really uh, a thing to do without blowing my own trumpet and thinking that I'm like some kind of crazy thought leader that uh, saw it before it was happening. I was using it and I could see the surgeons using it that I was dealing with. Um, and so I was communicating with them on there before it was, before it was social selling. And I was always, I always got pushed back for that from marketing who wanted to own it. Is that just stupid, the idea that marketing or sales, whoever owns anything, should sales and marketing just be one team? And should there be sales enablement people within every B2B company that are enabling all this and smoothing it over? And is that trend going to happen over the next few years? I think that that was about a 16-part question. So I'm going to address <laughs> uh, a couple of those. Yeah, I, th I think, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the leading companies operating in b2b today uh, have have integrated sales and marketing into one integrated into one cohesive effort it doesn't mean that they're the same team it doesn't mean they all do the same things it doesn't mean that there is an ownership over different parts of the funnel but it means that what it means is they're operating from the same set of objectives they're operating from the same set of definitions um, and they're coordinating their efforts in a way that appears more cohesive and generates more momentum and velocity with prospects as opposed to telling different stories and being totally separate and creating inefficiencies uh, both internally and externally. Um, I believe so. And we are definitely seeing you asked about sales enablement. We are absolutely seeing more companies embrace sales enablement. There are some that have been doing it for a long time. There are others that are investing in the people and the resources and the technology to do it better. I think it has emerged out of what used to just be sales operations, uh, which has always been tactical and reactive and, and run mostly by administrative people. And now in sales enablement, you've got, in many cases, a marketing-driven initiative uh, that is strategic, that is proactive, um, that has perhaps the biggest impact on the sales organization of any other initiative because it's focused on helping your reps be more successful. It's focused on helping them be more productive. It's measured by increase in conversion rate of opportunities to close. Um, it, it, it finally aligns the marketing organization and its content and its processes with the sales team's need to close more deals and do it faster and do it more effectively and do it in a more scalable way. So we are seeing that more. Uh, we, you know, we've done a couple research projects with a company called High Spot uh, that is in the sales enablement space. 
Uh, and it's become very clear uh, that not only are more organizations investing in sales enablement teams, but those that do um, are it is a it is a direct correlation between the organizations that have invested in sales enablement and those that are seeing literally 20, 30 percent plus increases in their conversion rates of opportunities to close deals. OK, well, let's come back to the practical aspect of this for the individual salesperson that's listening who isn't living in one of these bliss paradises where the company's <laughs> invested and uh, and they're perhaps ahead of the game slightly on this. Yeah. If they are spending and wasting time in CRM creating and curating content, is are they spending too much? What well, I want to get is, and I know I realize there's no magic bullet here, but are they spending too much time at the top of the funnel, too much time at the bottom of the funnel, where within the funnel is the most inefficiency? You know, I, I tend to, I mean, it's it's everywhere, but I think it's probably more so at the top of the funnel, right? Uh, because, you know, you don't, if, if you're on your own uh, and you're trying to figure out who to prospect to, you're spending an awful lot of time looking for the right people, trying to find the right contact information, trying to reach out to them, getting a voicemail, getting the main office line, not knowing what to say to that person. Um, sort of, you know, sort of fumbling around a little bit. And that all just takes a lot of time. And then you just go through that same sort of random uh, process over again with the next prospect. And so without um, support at the top of the funnel, without either inbound leads or the right list or the right set of prospects that you can call with some context, with an offer, with something of value, with a process, you know, any rep can figure this out on their own. Um, but it's a lot more effective if you've got a marketing team and a sales enablement team that's giving you those resources. So I, I, I tend to think the prospecting effort, because its conversion rates by definition are so low, uh, tends to generate the most inefficiency uh, for the process for the typical sales rep. And from that then, so you're talking about uh, contact information, running around, voicemails, emails, not getting returned. We can come on to the software side of this because some of them problems are relatively solved with that. But are people not putting in enough research up front before they make that first contact? And is that uh, an inefficient step here? Or generally, is it more efficient in a, in a weird paradoxical way to do spend less time researching and more time just spamming out as many calls as you can? Well, it's a good question because it would certainly be more efficient in terms of outbound calls to just take your list and just start calling, right? Just call everybody with the same message and the same offer and the same script. Um, that would be the most efficient way to make calls. The most efficient way to get leads and opportunities would be to have a scalable, repeatable process where you take a small amount of time to go and research that company, research that individual. Uh, Voresight, again, or you know, quote them again, they talk about a process called the three by three. They say take up to three minutes and find up to three things of interest with that prospect. It's something you have in common with them, something you think is interesting, something you can use as a trigger event or a buying signal to engage in the conversation. And so you know, what you don't want to do is spend the next 30 minutes researching a company to leave an 18 second voicemail. That's inefficient. Um, but if you invest a little bit of time in customizing your pitch, customizing your approach, you're far more likely to get someone's attention. And so productivity around activities, not that important. Productivity around getting qualified conversations, much more important. So I'm fine taking more time, a little more time, in a scalable, repeatable, predictable process to get to that next level of context and interest for the prospect to get the better conversions. So should salespeople, be list salespeople listening, should they be, if they're not given a process, because I've worked sales jobs where it's been, here's your phone, here's your territory, here's your company car, like, you know, see you later, see you at the end of the month when you've you've brought in a couple of million pounds worth of business, which is obviously like fantastic when it happens. But is the, for the salesperson listening that doesn't, is put in that situation, should they spend time experimenting themselves and putting some kind of process in place themselves? Of course, that can be shared with management and their colleagues later on. But is the, and what I'm getting right here, is the process the easiest way to knock out some of these inefficiencies in that if you've got a process, you wake up, you do this, you do this, you do this, at least you know by two o'clock in the afternoon, if you've done all your steps, you've done X amount of things for each of the steps, you know where you're at at least rather than, uh, I know I've, again, I've done sales jobs in the, in the surgical industry where I go and meet one surgeon that morning's just to write off. Then I go and do the next thing. And there's no real process to it other than eventually I'll close the deal with them. Yeah, I think um, 
if you're reinventing the way that you work every day, that that is going to generate a massive amount of inefficiency. Now, you may stumble upon and discover something that works, but if you're just reinventing it tomorrow and not building upon that success, then what have you really done? What have you really mm -hmm. discovered that's of any value? So to answer your question, yes, I, I, I fundamentally believe that the effective, repeatable, predictable processes are what are going to drive your success. I mean, like if you think about, you know, the success of salespeople, you look at the most successful salespeople in the world, they don't just wake up in the morning and, and, and close deals, right? They put in a lot of hard work. I mean, they've got a very disciplined approach. They're working their ass off, but they're doing it in a way where they come into work in the morning and they know what they need to do. Now, it doesn't make it any easier to do that, right? If you have to make 20 cold calls today to prospects that even if you've got good context, even if you've done your research, even if you know how you're gonna start that conversation, that is not fun. I don't care if you've been selling for two months or two years or two decades. Um, that's hard work, but you got to do it. Now, how are you going to make that call? What are you going to talk about? What are you going to do how you, as a follow-up? How are you going to record that and get to the next call? These are all processes that we are following. I mean, I, I run a small company with 11 people. Um, you know, sales is part of my job, but I do a lot of other things. I have to rely on some predetermined systems that can help me most efficiently get through the things I need to do every day. Now, I also have to measure whether or not that stuff is working. Because if I follow the same process for 10 years, it may have stopped working eight years ago, <laughs> right? So, you know, occasionally you do need to calibrate and measure what's working, but you just can't do that day after day. You can't just come, come in and just, well, how am I going to do it today? Um, is it just, it's just you, you are not going to see the scale uh, and the success that you otherwise want to achieve. So what you just said then brings me on to my, my final point of all this. And that is the hustle aspect of it all in that playing around in the CRM, creating content, looking for content, they're all relatively easy, non brain taxing things to do. If mm -hmm. you were, you know, if, if you were on a Friday afternoon to, uh, to track down salespeople, it's probably they're going to be the non hustlers are going to be in the CRM, updating things, slacking mm -hmm. off a bit finishing mm -hmm. 15 minutes early, mm -hmm. how much of your efficiency and that 33%, how much of it, and just your success in sales, how much of it is predetermined by not how much time you're spending doing things, but how little time you're spending doing just faffing around versus doing the hard stuff, if that makes sense. I, again, I feel like a lot of people listening to this will go, well, yeah, I, I spend 12 hours a day selling. But again, if you're spending 12 hours a day in CRM, it doesn't really matter and you're not really moved the needle. Would you rather have a rep that does, is a pain in the ass, never really fills in the CRM, but does all the sales tasks to a T or would you rather have, I guess, a balance of both? Yeah, it's, they're a great question. So let me try to answer it a couple of different ways. You know, the CRM is not, it, it, it's its purpose is to help us sell more, sell better, sell at scale, right? So CRM, I think fundamentally, and whether you're talking about Salesforce, Dynamics, Sugar, it really doesn't matter. CR, most CRM systems are built as a management tool, right? They are built as a tool to help us manage and scale the consistency of our operations as sales, as sales organizations. They're not fundamentally very good sales rep tools, right? Which is why you've got tools like SalesLoft and Tout and InsideSales.com and others that have created overlays that make it easier for reps to do their job and to get things done. So fundamentally, CRM is not required to be a successful sales rep. But I think the good sales reps are using it knowing that it does make them more efficient. It does tell them what to do. It does help them better focus their efforts. You know, you can you can work 12 hours a day and say, well, I didn't get everything done. And you're probably right. You can work four hours a day and say that you got the most important work done because you eliminated other obstacles. You eliminated distractions. You 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 refuse to focus on nonproductive work and you just literally put your blinders on and got the right work done. Um, so I, I would challenge anyone who says they're working 12 hours a day that they're actually working 12 hours a day on the right things, right? Like we all take our Facebook breaks. We all read the news. We look at the sports scores. We, you know, we do, this is, this is part of our day. Um, I remember when I was, when I was at Microsoft, you know, we had a, had a bunch of developers that, um, you know, they'd get frustrated when like the business folks would leave at five or six in the, at night and they'd be like, oh, you're not working very hard. It's like, yeah, but also I saw you come in at 11 o'clock in the morning and play ping pong until two. <laughs> so like we all have our habits, right? As long as the work gets done. So yeah, I would, 
you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the, 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 the exciting and terrifying thing about being a sales rep is that you own your number. You own your time. You own what you're going to do. If you want to slough off today and go play golf, great. But you are ultimately going to be accountable for that, right? Um, if you well, run let me, out of let me put it this way. You're going to hire someone, Matt. Would you hire the person who says, I get the important stuff done? Or would you hire the salesperson that says, I'm efficient with my time? It's the important stuff. It's the important stuff. But by definition, if they're working on the more important stuff, it, it tells me that they are being disciplined about their time, right? So for instance, like you come into work in the morning and you've got five things you need to do that day. I would argue that the number two through number five on your list are not nearly as important combined as number one on your list. Mm -hmm. Whatever is number one on your list is the thing you should be working on right now, no matter what else you have on your plate. It is probably also the most intimidating thing on your plate. It's probably the one thing you don't really want to spend a lot of time doing. And yet, you won't do it because you'll go check email and you'll take a phone call and you'll respond to a social chat. You'll, you'll find something else to do, right? So if I've got someone who's disciplined enough to know what that number one thing is and to focus first and foremost on getting that done and then spending their time on the next things, even if they take a ping pong break in between, I don't care. I would rather – and so being, to me, being efficient – and we talked about this earlier in terms of making phone calls. Being productive is not about getting the most things done. It's getting the right things done in the right order that are going to most efficiently lead you to success. And I'm glad you said that. And the reason I asked was that, and I've talked about this on the show loads of times, I always hit my numbers in sales. I, I always was perhaps not the 1%, but I was always the top 10%. But I was a massive pain in the ass because every report, any CRM thing that needed doing, I was always late with it. I was always... I'd be late to a internal meeting because I'd be on the phone of a customer closing deals from that perspective. And I was constantly getting told off all the time until the end of the quarter. And then obviously you're the hero at that point for the day. And then you go back to being told off again. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that as you know, business owner and that kind of thing. Cause I guess sales managers get wrapped up in it and cause they're, they're getting pressure from their, their bosses for the reports that they've been asked for and that kind of thing. So I can appreciate that. But yeah, I'm, I'm the, from the same spe perspective as you, Matt, in that you close the deals, you get the numbers done. And as long as it's done ethically, as long as no one's getting hurt in, in the process, and that's really what matters. So the, the purpose of sales processes, the purpose of systems, the purpose of saying, you know, we're going to come and we're going to make 20 calls before 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever, whatever your systems are as a sales team, the whole purpose of that is to create consistent, repeatable success across the sales floor. That's it, right? It's, it's not because we want to make 20 calls. It's not because we need everyone to spend time in CRM. It's because we believe as an organization that is the best, most efficient, most repeatable and scalable way to close business. Now, if you've got a rep that's hacked that system and found a better way, then it's possible that's unique to their personality. It's possible mm -hmm. that that actually doesn't scale well to other people. It's also possible they figured out a way to beat your system. They figured <laughs> out a better way of selling. So it's important to sort of take that stuff seriously. But again, just back to even sort of the analogy of like, or the question of should sales reps be creating content? Some are good at it. Most aren't, right? And so most should not be spending any of their time creating content. I would argue that even though some reps say, well, I've got a better way, most reps don't have a better way. And if the organization has invested time, effort, and discipline and science to build a sales process that by default is the most effective way to sell, I think as a rep, you follow that until you can prove a better system mm -hmm. exists, until you can prove you can hit your number in a different, better way. And so, uh, I'm look, I, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of sales organizations, and sometimes the very best sales reps are the highest maintenance sales reps because they don't want to follow the system. They want to try other things. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. And as long as there's transparency and accountability on both sides of that, I'm willing to let – I'm willing to as – a, as a manager and as a consultant, I'm willing to run with that. Because those reps may be actually like hitting their number and then some. They may be teaching me the way we need to be selling over the course of the next six to 12 months versus the way that we've sold the past six to 12 months. Good stuff. I'm glad you said that. I think that's really empowering for anyone who, like me, was a pain in the ass. <laughs> and um, yeah, with that, I've got a couple of questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show. Yeah. Uh, first one, who do you think is the world's greatest salesperson? Mm, the world's greatest salesperson. You know, I think... Um, well, I, it's, it's funny, like if I can if I can say alive or dead, I'd say probably Jesus Christ, right? You know, whether you're a believer or not, I mean, you look at sort of the lasting impact of the movement that, that, that he has he has created. Um, you know, I also look at uh, I look at people like Mark Benioff. Uh, you know, if you if you if you ever get a chance to watch him present at the at the Dreamforce conference, 
Um, he's just brilliant. I think, you know, I think he, I look at guys like him and I look at guys like Steve Jobs who have just mastered the art of persuasion, the art of sort of, just of, of, of communicating and drawing emotion into their presentations and, and creating a movement behind what is just, what is fundamentally a business proposition is, is very, very impressive. Next one. And, and this ties into efficiency. What's one thing that you do every single day that you can account some of your success to? You know, every morning I have a 7.30 meeting with myself that I call my daily do. And it's a list of things that I need to be doing every day. And some of them are related to prospecting. Some of them are related to setting up my what I need to be doing during the day. Um, some of them are about building my network. It's a laundry list of things that I do every day. And because I've got a list of them, I can get through them in literally about 20, 25 minutes. But they're foundational to uh, building my business, to building my network, to making me productive for the day. And so that is something I do every day um, consistently. Nice. Okay, next one. And I've flipped and flopped between asking this to different guests. And I'm going to ask it you though, Matt, because I, and I want you to go deeper than making my customers happy with your answer. But okay. what motivates you personally to close deals? Um, I mean, me personally, it's my family. You know, I, so I've, I mentioned I've got this 11 person team and, uh, you know, we're growing, we're doing well, but this is a lifestyle business for me, uh, because there's no investors, there's no one telling me I have to go to a certain rate. Um, you know, my family is my motivation. So closing a deal. Yeah. I want to make customers happy, but ultimately, you know, I, I, I want, I, I am passionate about doing something I love that allows me to feed my family and support the goals that we have and increasingly support, uh, you know, the families of the people working here. It's very gratifying. It's very humbling. Um, and so uh, I do it for them. Nice. Thank you for that. And final one, Matt, and I asked you this last time you came on the show. So it'd be intriguing to see if it's changed. But if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? You know, it's, to be better at selling, I'd say there's a there's there's a level of humility and transparency and customer centricity uh, that that I think are fundamental to being successful in sales. I think it's really easy to get on your high horse and be excited about what you're selling. It's easy to get defensive when someone has an objection. It's easy to get into spin mode when you know you don't <laughs> you don't necessarily have the answer that you want to give a customer. But I found that when you can be humble and transparent, when you can be authentic with someone, um, you know, those are the foundations of building good relationships. Those are the foundations of accelerating trust and credibility. Um, people give you the benefit of the doubt. People don't expect everyone to be perfect. They don't expect products and systems to work all the time. But if they trust you and they believe your heart's in the right place, um, you're much more likely to get the deal and keep the deal. So, and you threw a lot of stuff out there, but and I feel it's not uh fundamental underlying thread and we talk about this a lot on the show if you had to put that into one line uh, would uh, me putting words in your mouth but would that be to just tell yourself to be authentic i think so i think so there's a um uh there's a a country song uh here in the states by a by an artist by the name of tim mcgraw and the, the song is called uh, humble and kind and i think about that a lot in that context as well right i think you know you could say be authentic or you could also say just be humble and kind you know, and I think that there's ways to extrapolate that message, but um, I think that works in 99% of situations um, that you're dealing with in business and in life. Amazing stuff. Well, with that, Matt, always tell us a little bit about your blog and always tell us a little bit about where the audience can find out more about you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, I've been uh, keeping it. We, we blog every day at HeinzMarketing.com. That's H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at, at Heinz Marketing. Uh, I've written a handful of books. The last book I wrote uh, released just literally two weeks ago called Full Funnel Marketing. Really encourages marketers to think beyond just leads, beyond traditional marketing in terms of supporting the entire sales cycle. Um, you can find that on our website as well. Just go to the resources page. You can download a free PDF of that book, uh, Full Funnel Marketing at HeinzMarketing.com. Good stuff. And we'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, Matt, I genuinely really enjoyed the conversation. I want to thank you for your time and thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. And there we have it. Thank you, Matt, for coming on the show. I massively appreciate your time. I think this is a really interesting topic. I think it's a topic we could dive into in a million different ways in, in future episodes. And so I'm going to look into that. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in. Massively appreciate your time. As always, and I said at the beginning of the show, I'll say it again now. There's no show without you guys. And so I genuinely appreciate you tuning in. And with that said, I'll speak with you all tomorrow.